what to do when you don't know what to do. (laughs) Amen. The scripture says, when the righteous rule, that means when righteous, when the righteous is in authority, right? The Bible says the people rejoice. Amen. So we're going to talk this morning about a king who was righteous and how God caused him and his people to rejoice when he was in a situation where he didn't know what to do. And we're going to connect that to our lives. We're going to learn what to do when we don't know what to do. So Jehoshaphat, he was a king who walked God's way. He was a righteous man. When a man or a woman choose God's way, you can be sure that his or her commitment will be challenged by the enemy. We're taking our text today from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So in the midst of delighting himself in the ways of the Lord, that's when King Jehoshaphat received the bad report. Actually, it was a devastating report. You know, a bad report we may be able to handle, but a devastating report, we need God. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? What happens when you get hit with a very bad report and you have no time to strategize or even know how to strategize? How do you face such a crisis? We're going to look at Jehoshaphat, someone who was given bad news, and he clearly stated, I don't know what to do. In this story, we will see what he did to deal with the crisis facing him and learn how, what we must do to deal with the crisis that we often face. So I'm going to just read through the story and talk as we go through it. So it happened after this, after what? After Jehoshaphat and his, the people of Israel had found peace They were in the promised land. They were doing fine. Everything was good, right? And then all of a sudden, something happened. What happened? Moab, with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Amorites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea. From beyond the sea. They're coming a long way from Seir, and they are in Hazan Tarmar. Now, with this devastating news, what he's hearing is there are three armies coming after him. Three. So, what happened? The Bible says Jehoshaphat feared. So what's the first thing he did? He feared. He feared. Fear is an emotion that can come without notice, like bad news, right? You get bad news, and that fear can grip you at the point that you become immobilized. It can literally take your breath away when the news is that bad. It stands to reason why God tells us so many times in the scripture, do not fear. It's not healthy. It's terribly stressful. And the Bible says there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. The scripture tells us that fear has torment. So fear is something that is straight from the enemy, is straight from Satan. And with it is his attempt to devour you. Sometimes people don't like it when you say, don't fear. Sometimes people don't like it when you say, just trust, not just, but trust God. They think that you're minimizing the situation, but actually, That's the best thing that you could tell them. The most godly and powerful thing you can do is to trust God. But when you say that to people who don't understand, they think you're just being dismissive, but you're not. You're really giving them good information. So not one, but three armies were coming against Jehoshaphat. And he didn't stand a chance and he knew it. So what did he do? The very next thing he did He either got over the fear, or in spite of the fear, it doesn't matter, right? You either get over it, or you move forward in spite of it. But the Bible says he set himself to seek the Lord. That's what he did next. He proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. So Judah gathered together 
to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. So here's what Jehoshaphat did. He set himself to seek the Lord, right? In other words, he made seeking the Lord his absolute first priority. And part of his seeking the Lord was that he proclaimed a fast. When he proclaimed that fast, he got everybody involved. Everybody did something to participate in dealing with the problem and seeking God. And he asked people to ask the the Lord for help, right? He asked for help from the Lord. Now, here's the thing. He got everyone involved. He called them to a fast, and he called them to assemble. Assembly is important. Even back in those days, they came to the temple, and they assembled themselves together to pray on the behalf of their nation. They didn't just stay at home. They came together. That's the way of saying we are unified. We are one, and we are going to stand against the enemy together, and we're going before God as one and ask God for his help. So the scripture already told us he didn't know what to do. For some who don't know what to do, for someone who didn't know what to do, I think he made some pretty good decisions about what to do. He gave some good directions. He said, fast, assemble yourselves, and let's go seek the Lord. So let's take a minute and look at fasting. What is fasting about? As we know, fasting means going without food for a period of time. It's a way of showing total submission, humility, and resolve that one understands that their help comes from the Lord, right? It's a statement that they are earnest and they will not give into their flesh. They don't accommodate their flesh in any way. They don't satisfy their flesh until they fully laid out their petition before God, before they fully know that God has heard their heart. And then once they know God has heard their heart and trust and faith and believe, they can discontinue to fast. I'm saying they, it can be we, it can be anybody. The scripture does not mandate that we fast. Sometimes fasting can be legalism. It can be, you know, people have to fast every Wednesday or whatever. Feel free to choose when and how you want to fast, but it's not mandated to fast. But fasting really says, God, you got my attention. You have my attention and I want yours. And so fasting is a way of telling God that you're serious and he has your full attention. I think, unfortunately, we get in situations where without God, we don't stand a chance, but for some reason, we don't know it. So we think we can figure it out ourselves. We don't, take, we don't make calling on God our first primary solution. And I think we can all attest to that. There are times when we know we're in a situation that we got a problem and we scuffle and try to figure it out and we think, we call our friend, we do a whole lot of things, but we don't call on God first. You don't really realize how bad the situation is and your friends can't help you in some situations, but only God can. Unlike Jehoshaphat, we don't understand and so we don't make God a first priority. So it goes on to say, In verse 6, and this is what he said, the Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? He's praying now. Are you not the God who's in heaven? Are you not the God of my ancestors? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands, and no one can withstand you. The first thing we can notice here is that he calls on the God that he knows right? He's calling on God and he's telling God, I know who you are. You are the God of my ancestors. You did great things in the past. I know who I'm talking to. He said, you rule over all the kingdoms. He's talking about God's greatness. I know how great you are, God. Power and might are in your hand. And when I saw that, I'm like, hand? That's only one. What, he got his other hand tied behind his back? Yeah, that's how powerful God is. He says, and no one can withstand you. The first thing we notice, again, is that he calls on a God he knows. The same God who delivered Israel in the past is the same God that he's talking to now. The same God that his forefathers knew in past generations is the same God he's talking to now. He's talking to a God that in his mind has not changed. 
You're the same God. You did it for them. I know you can do it for us. Same God, today, yesterday, and forever. Jehoshaphat is calling on a God who he recognizes as the one who is in charge, a God who dwells in heaven, which means he's not like man who dwells in the earth, right? The scripture tells us that he rules over all the kingdoms of the nations. You know, sometimes it's good just to look at who God is and his majesty and his greatness. This is what God says about himself, right? This is what the Lord says about himself. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Can you imagine? Heaven is his throne and he props his feet up on the earth. I mean, that's imagery, of course, but it just shows you of his greatness. He's saying, could you build me a temple as good as that? Um, No. Heaven is his place of rule. That's what you do on a throne, you rule. Heaven is his place of rule. You can't build a temple greater than heaven. And then he goes on to say, could you build me such a resting place? Can you build me an earth or something bigger that I can rest on? The earth is his footstool. He goes on to say, my hands have made them both. His hands made heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. He says everything is already, already mine, right? What is he doing? Why do we talk like that? We're reminding ourselves of how big God is. We're building our faith. He's building his faith as he's praying. He's building the faith of the people he's talking to as he's praying. He's getting to a place where he's be able to begin to hear God, believe God, walk in faith. He's reminding himself and others, the people in his ear, and to the sound of his voice, who God is. In this prayer, Jehoshaphat is telling God, I know who you are. Sometimes when we go to the Lord, we have to remind ourselves in our prayers who we're praying to. We're not telling this to God because he doesn't know. He knows who he is. God, you rule over all the earth. You own it all. You're saying this to God as you build your faith. Right? The Bible tells us. You know, it says this, heaven is his throne, and then the Bible tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Right? That means heaven is a throne of grace. Unmerited, unearned favor. That's why God tells us not to fear. He goes on to pray. Now after he's finished telling God, who he was, now he's going to tell God what he did. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants in this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Do you think God forgot? No, but as Jehoshaphat is speaking, he is reminding the people in prayer of what God has already done. He's bringing to memory what God has done. He's building faith, as I said, He says, you you drove out the people that were here, and you gave us this land. That's how they got there. Remember? That's how y'all got here. God drove out the people, the inhabitants before you. Hasn't God done that for you? What has God already done for you? You need to recall, remind yourself. I need to recall and remind myself of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. What about that job he gave you when you didn't think you had a chance? What about that check you got in the mail when you were broke? What about that wayward child he brought home or that accident he saved you from? Think, think. You know what he's done for you in the past. Why would you think now he would fail you? Whatever you're going through, think about the things I'm saying. Why would he fail you now? He won't. It's not in his nature to fail. God's not a failure. And it goes on to say, and they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary for your name, saying, right? Now, he already prayed to God and said, heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. And God has said, how can you top that? Well, they really didn't, but they did their best. They built the temple, amen? And he said, God, we put your name on this temple. You dwell here. 
with us in this temple. Your people now dwells in that land that you gave us, and we've built you a sanctuary. And this is what they, they said. Here's what they told God when God delivered them and gave them the land. They said, Lord, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence. For your name is in the temple, and we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. They told God this long before the trouble came, right? This is something we have to confess while we're at peace. God, if, when the trouble comes, I'm going to call on you. You're the first one I'm going to go to. I'm going to call on your name. He said, no matter what peril comes upon us, he named it first, the sword, that's what's coming. That's exactly what's coming. Judgment, whatever. We will come into your temple and we are going to cry out to you. And that's exactly what they did. Notice he didn't say, I hope God hears us. God, we hope you will hear us when we call you. He said, no, you will hear us and you will save us. God will save us out of our calamity when we call upon his name. How many of us have prayed something similar but then didn't keep up our end? Oh God, if you just get me out of this situation, if you just let my child out of jail, I'll serve you. Or just heal me and I'll serve you. Then God does what we ask just because he loves us. And then two weeks later, we forget. We don't go to church, we stop praying, we stop worshiping. We got what we wanted, but we're, we're but flesh. God is not like that. Reminds me of the 10 lepers. Remember he healed 10? He, and, and he said, go and be healed. And as they went, they were healed. And only one came back to say thank you. That's how we can get in the flesh. Only one came back. But does that mean that God won't help you the next time? Of course not. Because he's God. He's not like man. So again, verse 9 says, if disaster comes upon us, we will cry out to you and you will help us. The Bible tells us that was what was written in the past. That's the Old Testament. That's what we're reading now. It was written for our learning. God wants us to know, if we cry out to him, he will help us. It's going with the story in verse 10. And now, here, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Sarah, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. See, there was a time when God brought the people of Israel out, and they came across the land of these three enemies. And they, they were the sons, the descendants of Lot and Ammon and, couple at the Mo, and Moab. And God had promised these people land as well. So God said, bypass them. If you go through their land, anything you get, pay for it, right? Do not destroy these people. Well, they were a small nation at, this, at that point in time. And then they grew. And so now they're huge armies and they're coming after the very people who let them go in the first place, right? That ever happened to you? People that you help, people that, whose lives you make a difference in. Maybe at work, you help somebody get a promotion, they get the job and then they treat you like, <laughs> you know, like you had nothing to do with it. They forget, people forget, but God doesn't forget. He goes on to say, here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. So they're calling on God. And this is what they're saying. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us. Here they're acknowledging that they are powerless against this enemy. He's saying, if it's up to us, we're going to lose. We are going to lose this battle. And he goes on to say, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. 
It's almost opposite. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's what you do. He answered his own question. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You focus on Jesus. You may be clueless, but God is not. He already has the answer. He already has a plan. He already has the plays in motion on your behalf. He's already making it work out for your good. No matter where you are in the process of figuring it out, you're already late to the game. But you have to do what the scripture says. The Bible tells us in all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. He went and he acknowledged God. Nothing is impossible for, for God. Nothing is too hard for God. The reason you're having a difficult time believing, this is for us, the reason we have a difficult time believing is because we can't see it. We can't understand how it's going to be done. It doesn't make sense in our eyes. How does this, an army like Jehoshaphat fight three armies at once? You look at your situation. Why are you struggling with believing? Because you can't see it. You can't figure out how it's going to be done. But we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. The Bible tells us that the just, that is us, shall live by faith. So here's what happened. In verse 13, it goes on to say, Now all of Judah, with their little ones, their wives, their children, stood before the Lord, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Giselle. Now remember, we have the spirit of the Lord living in us. In this day and time when God spoke to the prophet, and he still does today, but we have the spirit in us. The Bible, this prophet, we speak from the word of God, but we have a relationship with God because God is in us. But in these days, the, the word came to this prophet and he told him what to do. He said, listen, listen, all of you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, right? Like there's three, right? But he singled them out. You King, listen, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid. Where have I heard that before? The first thing Jehoshaphat was, was afraid. The first thing the Holy Spirit said, God said was, don't be afraid. So he addressed that first. God knows that we fear sometimes. God knows the struggles that we go through. But he reminds us, don't be afraid. He says, don't be dismayed because of this great multitude. Now, what's the difference between being dismayed and being afraid? When you're dismayed, you're sad. You feel hopeless. There's no encouragement, right? So not only are you dealing with fear, you're dealing with hopelessness. The battle is not yours, but God's. This is what God told them through the prophet. That within itself, that statement alone is life-changing when you really get it. The battle is the Lord's. Why? Because we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. What you're going through is a spiritual battle. It's spiritual warfare. The Bible says Satan goes to and fro seeking whom he may devour. You got it, right? In Hebrew, that word devour, it does not only mean destroy, but it comes with the connotation to pick apart, to divide, to confuse, right? So how does Satan destroy you? He picks your brain. He divides your thinking. He causes confusion, right? That's how he gets you. The Bible tells us that Satan is the author of confusion, his approach to devouring you is to turn you against yourself, to confuse you about who God is, and to pick apart your brain with worry and fear. It's a trap. Our flesh, our emotions are no match for the enemy. They're not. He wants you to get emotional, worried, confused, and fearful. This is what the enemy does. But the Bible says the weapon of, weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal means of the mind. Your weapons are not of the mind. You can't win by thinking. You cannot think your way out of your situation. But the enemy tries to make you think you can. That's why you sit up all night and you worry. That's why we, right, 
can be so frustrated and worried about our situation, that's a trap. If the enemy can just keep you there and keep you from moving forward in faith, you're sunk. You're stuck. That's why the Bible says don't fear. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. This verse is saying that in the battles that believers face, physical weapons or human strategies are not the solution, but our weapons are mighty in God, right? What are the spiritual weapons through God that we're talking about that pulls down strongholds? What are those weapons? Faith, prayer, truth, righteousness through Christ, God's word, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Those are our weapons. They're not carnal. Those are the weapons of our warfare. If you try to fight your battles with your mind, you will lose. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold is a place of control or power. In a natural battle, a fort would be considered a stronghold. In a spiritual sense, it refers to areas in our lives where sin, fear, negative thoughts, or any form of negativity is a stronghold to control. A stronghold or control. So instead of walking by faith, we walk by our feelings or by sight. But part of this verse is saying that the spiritual weapons given by God have the power to demolish these strongholds. Sin, fear, negative thoughts, lies are all strongholds that are demolished by our spiritual weapons of faith, truth, the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. These are weapons the spiritual resources of God uses to pull down our strongholds. There's no other way. But if you don't use them, guess what? You lose because that's all we got. That's how we win. So JJL with the Spirit still on him, is telling them what God is saying. They already received the comfort of knowing that the battle is not theirs, but the Lord's. So what do they do next? Right? So we go on with the story. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. He says it again. For the Lord is with you, right? So whatever you're going through, you have to know that God is with you. You are not in this alone. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord and worshiped the Lord. They just started to worship. Hadn't thrown a brick, a stone, Nothing. No war had broken out. Nothing had happened. But they started to worship. Right? Goes on to say, Then the Levites of the children of, of the Korhites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord. So they bowed in worship. They stood in praise for, to the Lord God of Israel with their voices high. So and they, they, they had a praise party, actually, is what they did. They're worshiping and praising God for a battle that hasn't even been fought yet. There's a song we used to sing. It was called, Don't Wait Till the Battle's Over, Shout Now. Some of y'all may remember that. Right. Because they're worshiping and praising God from their vantage point the vantage point of what they see, the vantage point of victory that they know God's going to give them. So they rose early in the morning, this is the next day, and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. He had to remind them. And see, sometimes... You know, we think we have a good prayer today. We spend an hour, sometimes maybe two longer. Depends on what your day is like, what you can do in God's presence. And we worshiped. And that day is over. And the next day comes. And you can't always go on that same juice from the day before. 
right? He had to remind them again. After all that jubilee, after all that praise, after all that worship, after all that prophecy, they get up in the morning, he said, remember, God is with you, right? Believe in the Lord your God. The scripture says that without faith, it is impossible to believe God. The Bible says, and you shall be established. To be established means to, made, to be made firm, stable, in a position. So when you're st- struggling with trying to be strong while you're enduring a hardship, or you're fighting a spiritual battle, which for the believer, all your battles are spiritual, right? In order to be firm, stable, or secure, what do you have to do? You have to believe in the Lord your God. It's the believing that gets you strong, right? You don't, you're not strong because you believe, right? The believing makes you strong. The more you believe, the stronger you become, right? I don't believe. I'm not strong enough yet. No, you got that backwards. Believe on the Lord, and then you'll be established, And it goes on to say, believe in his prophets. That means trust the messages from the messengers, right? Because they're bringing you the word of God. And this is what he was telling the people. You just heard from a prophet of God. You just heard a word from the Lord. Believe what you heard. God has given us words, prophecies, has ministered to us, has told us things that haven't even come to pass yet. And if we're not careful, we'll forget. We'll say, we'll think, oh, that that's not, oh, I forgot. That didn't happen. But God doesn't forget. But when you believe, then you step out in faith and you begin to accomplish the things God has said that he's going to do on your behalf. Prophets in the Bible are often seen as God's mouthpiece, God's mouthpieces delivering his words, his prophecies, and instructions to the people. So Jehoshaphat is saying, remember the word that God told us yesterday. If you want the victory today, believe, believe the message from the Lord. You're here today if you want to see a victory in your life without stress, right? If you're here today and you want to see the victory in your life without stress, anxiety, fear, and grief, understand that what you're going through is a spiritual battle and you cannot fight it with carnal weapons, but you can fight it God's way by faith in the power of God. And then... When he had consulted with the people, in other words, he started now talking to the people, uh, having this conversation about the strategies, what are we going to do, who's going to do what, when, where, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who would praise the beauty of his holiness. The ones who were singing the day before, he's like, I want you and you and you, y'all good with that? Come on, I want to put y'all on the front line. I want you to go out first before the army wait, we only sing. I know that. We only worship. I know that, right? Because that's where your strength is. That's where your power is. It's in praise and worship. Sometimes we come to church and we praise and we see Julian and and, and CJ and Meg worshiping and leading us in worship. And sometimes we don't realize they're really leading us into the presence of God. It's up to you if you want to go, right? Now we know God's here. We know his presence is here. But do we always unite, ignite that spirit within us? Do we always make that connection? When you get into worship, that's exactly what will happen. And when you get into worship, the enemy gets scared. He runs. He flees. He cannot stand worship. So when you're struggling, when you got a battle, what do you want to do? Right? Worship. Worship. Praise God. Thank God. Tell him who he is. Tell him what he's done. Remind yourself. And then you walk away believing, trusting, knowing, oh, God's going to take care of that one. God's in charge. I know he will. So he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and they were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy has said grace endures forever. I think here it's telling us that King Jehoshaphat told them of the battle plan to put the singers in worship in the front line. The spiritual warriors went out before the natural warriors. That's how much they believed that God was going to fight for them. Who, who's going to sign up for that? Yeah, I'll go in the front line. I sing. Okay. You got to believe in order to do that. Look at your situation. What seems ridiculous, if you were to tell a friend, well, I know God's going to do this. That don't seem ridiculous to them because they don't understand. They don't have the mind of Christ. 
or at least they don't know your situation. They may be believers, and they may say, oh, I know with God all things is possible, depending on their level of faith, but you can't depend on their faith. You have to depend on yours. I know in whom I believe. And so they were willing to take the front line. Most of the time, how God's going to do something is incomprehensible. You have no idea how God's going to do it. You know it. God rarely shows up the way we think he will in the place you're looking. Isn't that true? You thought he was coming here, and you thought he was fixing that. No, he's over here, and he's fixing that. You're like, yeah, God I did need that fixed too, by the way. Right? And he still hasn't forgotten what was over here that you've been calling on and asking him to fix. He can multitask. Amen. Amen. Now, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, God set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. God is setting an ambush for your enemy, and they were defeated. Whatever your enemy is, doesn't have to be a person, but if it comes against you, causes strife, fear, worry, that's your enemy, and God is setting an ambush for them. What's an ambush? You don't see it coming. You didn't know it was there. So that's, what, that's where your face at, God. I know you got an ambush, right? You got a ram in the bush, <laughs> right? You got something that's going to fix this, something that's going to redeem this. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy destroy them. So what they did is the Ammonites and the Moabites together fought the Mennonites. That's the, for the people of Mount Seir, right? So two of the armies got together, fought the third army, and then they fought and destroyed each other. Who would have thunk? So when Judah came, to a place overlooking the wilderness. This is after the battle. They looked toward the multitude, and there were dead body, bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering all the spoil because there was so much. God doesn't just give you the victory. You are more than conquerors. I'd say that's more than a conquest. And they didn't even have to fight. What happens when you don't fight and you just rest like God tells you to do and just believe like God tells you to do? There was an abundance. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka. For there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place is called the Valley of Baraka until this day. So what did they do before the battle? They assembled and prayed. What did they do after the battle? They assembled. It didn't say they went and spent the money and played with the loot and all that. It said, no, the next day they went, found the valley, and called it Baraka. It's the Valley of Blessings. They acknowledged God had blessed them, Right? They didn't forget, God, you did it again. You blessed us. They returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. They brought the worshipers right back to the house of the Lord, giving God all the glory. They went back to Jerusalem and couldn't wait to give God the praise. So when you don't know what to do, humbly admit your dependence on God and worship. When you are at your wit's end, you know, your wit's end, that's what it's like sometimes. You are just so stressed. That means you are mentally and emotionally spent. Worship. You can never go wrong if you worship. Have you ever been at your wit's end? You know where this expression comes from? It comes from the Bible, Psalms 107. It details what it's like to be at your wit's end. It's compared to an uncontrolled environment of a raging storm. 
Your wit's end is the place of instability marked by spiritual, emotional, and mental ups and downs. And this is how he describes a wit's end. This is what he's trying to keep you not to do. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the rays of the sea. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. Their soul melts because of they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man that are at their wit's end. I know I can see the image on TV. People are holding their head and shaking their head. And, oh, my gosh, what do I do? At your wit's end, your soul, your inner man, you are spiritually famished. The Bible says, this, this is still in um, Psalms 107, that when you're at your wit's end, it goes on to say, then when you cry out in your trouble, right? The Bible says they cried out in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. But why would he allow devastating storms in my life and yours? Why would God permit an enemy to have an alliance against me? Why would God allow me to come to my wit's end? Maybe it's because at your wit's end, when you feel deserted, powerless, and fearful that you learn what to do when you don't know what to do. Once you master what God tells you to do in his word, while others are running around, wringing their hands in despair, you know exactly what to do. You have to move from fear to faith. Whenever you fear, it's because you allow the spirit of fear to seize control of your mental processes. Remember what it says in Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Every area of your life is governed by fear or by faith. In the face of impossible situations for which you have no answer, you will either be immobilized by fear or mobilized by faith. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen. Jehoshaphat feared initially, but he did not continue to operate in fear. Jehoshaphat effected a mighty victory against the enemy. When you don't know what to do, do like Jehoshaphat. Seek the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Believe what the prophets have spoken. Get on the front line and worship. Thank God for the victory in advance because the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the assurance that you're on our side in every battle we face. We are comforted by the words of the scripture that reminds us the battle is not ours, but yours. Lord, help us to lay down our worries, our fears, and our need to control outcomes. Give us the courage to step back and not lean on our own understanding, but trust in your will, your wisdom, and your timing. May we ever be mindful that we do not stand alone, but with the Almighty God and Father who has already gotten us the victory. Father, guide us throughout this week. May we carry this truth in our heart. By your grace and love, lead us through every challenge to every victory. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.